It says welcome announcements. Just one announcement uh, uh, for us today is uh, to uh, uh, keep you abreast of the uh, Wednesday night Lent services at 7 o'clock. Also soup supper. And uh, so uh, we had about 100 folks here for soup supper and Lent services last uh, uh, Ash Wednesday. So uh, uh, it's a great uh, midweek uh, break, but it's also time for spiritual renewal. And so the other announcement is simply to get up and greet each other and welcome each other and, and introduce yourself by name because I'm sure that you don't know everybody here. Okay, so do that now. Okay. So our topic in worship uh, today is uh, making a difference. That's our ongoing theme. Uh, don't get tired of it because we have a few more weeks. Uh, and each Sunday we have an opportunity to see how we can make a difference in a different way for God's kingdom. And this, morning, this afternoon God's word directs us to his purpose for the church. What's the church all about? Or it says in your folder, why on earth does the church exist? Why does the church exist on the earth? And, uh, and we'll hear God speak to that from his word today. And with this in mind, let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our refuge, and God, our strength. The battle of good and evil rages all around us, and sometimes within us, and in our lives. We pray tonight that you would keep us strong and steady in faith as your word strengthens us. And Lord, when we fall, 
We pray that you would pick us up and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel for today, the first Sunday in the season of Lent, is recorded in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It's written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took Jesus up to the holy city and ha had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, the devil said. Because it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to the devil, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to Jesus, all this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and the angels came Holy Gospel and the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to
Good afternoon. Afternoon. I think it's afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's five. The New Testament lesson is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Following the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them faith, the followers of Jesus devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. The, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in reading, we get a picture of what the church was like uh, in the days, well, following the day of Pentecost, 51 days after Easter. Jesus had risen. The followers of Jesus, Jesus devoted them to the apostles' teaching. The apostles had learned what Jesus shared with them and told them to, to teach others. And so the followers devoted themselves to those teachings and to the fellowship, to caring for one another. Kind of like what went on here at the beginning. You know, you just start talking to each other. If you know it, you get to know each other a little better. Some shared stories about college students and whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, they were together, and they had everything in common. That's a different culture there where they shared a lot more. And if you had a need, he would sell everything he had to get to help you out. See? And, uh, oh, wouldn't that be nice? You know? um, and, uh, and they continued to meet in the temple courts every day. And they, they ate together in their homes. And they were, had glad and sincere hearts about it. No obligation. And the result of that, the Lord added to their number every single day. Now, if you're like me, when you hear this, you say, well, we're not the New Testament church. Well, yes, we are. <laughs> we're not the church 51 days after Jesus rose from the grave. But we still are a church, and this is still ought to be the marks of the church devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship of believers, to care and encouragement and support for one another. Because it's a hard world out there, the dirty and the temptation of Jesus. So let's just take a, a moment here as we begin our worship to, to take an inventory of ourselves and, and, and uh, our relationship to the Lord and his church, uh, especially in light of these things, devoted to the apostles' teaching fellowship, prayer, and being together for support. So let's confess our sins to the Lord. Others, please go ahead and confess, but uh, with that in mind. Gospel writer said, Jesus is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. And God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has poured out his Holy Spirit now to bring the light of the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ and to bring them to faith in him. This is what happened in those days. The Holy Spirit worked in people's hearts through the fellowship of believers like that. And others came to faith. Live then as children of the light, because Jesus died to forgive your sins. I want to assure you that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's stand and praise the Lord, who is mighty to save.
lift up your hearts. It is right to praise and thank the Lord our God through Jesus Christ. Sharing our humanity, Jesus lived among us, revealing the Father's glory and love and power so that our darkness could give way to his own glorious light. Jesus shines on us now through the words and the promise he made on the night when he was betrayed, when he took the bread of the Passover meal. And when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup and the wine, the, the, wine, the cup of deliverance. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the New Testament, the new promise in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Be seated. Can you assistance come forward?
body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. And remain standing, please, for the second gospel. Doubly blessed today. According to St. Matthew, chapter 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, well, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they were saying he was speaking about himself, and they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus asked them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon and Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that now you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. This is the Holy Gospel and the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words that we're spoken and uh, that, we're going to, that are going to be spoken now and the thoughts that they, they produce in our hearts, oh Lord, may your spirit uh, use them, that we might be aligned with your purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We be seated. So, here we are. There's the band. Thank you. Well, we, yeah, okay, yeah. So thanks, Ben, and you know, we don't always uh, say thank you to you, and this is not about praising you, but it's thanking God for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the time of Lent has begun. 40 days, not including Sunday, so today's not a day of Lent. So we can have a little bit of joy, a little bit strange, okay, like good Lutherans, right? And uh, say, Good Friday's coming, we can be really somber. No, sorry. Really. But the 40 days don't include Sundays. And the 40 days end with the day of resurrection. The celebration of Christ's victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. 40 days, a lot of symbolism in that number. It's the number of years that the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. Saying, God, why are you doing this to us? You know? And yet God provided them with manna. Anybody know what the word manna means? What is it? So they woke up in the morning, yeah, good, and they found this stuff on the ground, was food from God, and they said, What is it? You know, you don't ever do that when mom puts food out in front of you, right? What is it? <laughs> so they wandered 40 years in the desert. It was the number of days that Jesus was in the wilderness, tempted. By the, by the devil, as we heard. But he wasn't only the devil in the wilderness with Jesus. He was alone except for the angels and the devil. And the devil was determined to make sure that Jesus would not be in the position to honor his Father's will for him. God the Father's will that his Son would come into the flesh, and that happened, and would become the payment for the sin of the whole world. And so that was Jesus' purpose. And the devil wanted to make sure that didn't happen. He was determined to have Jesus sin. And that's what's behind those three temptations. And those temptations were fierce. And the battle was win, lose, no ties. A loss by Christ would be devastating. So Jesus fasted. And I don't know if you've ever fasted. Okay, but you get hungry. And uh, now the purpose of fasting, by the way, is not to give up something for Lent. Okay, but the purpose of fasting is so that we hunger. And so that when your body has those hunger pains, the purpose of fasting is that your intellect would take over and say, I have these hunger pains, pangs. May I hunger and thirst for Jesus and his righteousness. Okay, that's the purpose of fasting, to make us aware of our need for Christ. 
But Jesus was in the wilderness. He fasted. He probably had water. He prayed. And he was tempted. But he didn't sin. And he was ministered to by the angels. And what did Jesus use to resist temptation? The, lady? the word of God. Every time Satan tempted him, Jesus said, it is written. The word says. And the, and the devil also used the word. He says, it is written, Jesus, that you know your angels are going to pick you up. And he, Jesus says, don't tempt the Lord your God. He used the, the word of God when he was tempted. And all of this means that Jesus was able to accomplish the Father's purpose for him. To save us from our sins. So that each and every one of us, receiving Christ by faith through his word and through the sacrament, and counting his sacrifice on our behalf for the forgiveness of sin, so that every one of us would be reconciled to God and have eternal life. And I, <clears throat> I pray that God's word of truth that we've heard today, the word made flesh in Jesus, that God's word of truth would be your rock and would be your salvation and would be your hope and would be your faith and would be your peace. Because that's God's will for you. It's true. And my prayer also is that God's purpose is for us. That's his outcome for you personally. Every one of us personally. But I pray that God's outcome for us and his church will be what motivates your life and your living. You see, there's a difference between the purpose of Jesus going to the cross to save us from our sin and the purpose of the church. Last Sunday, you, and this was the worshiping community of Somerset Hills, wherever you are, of all of you, not just members of the church, at the end of the message time last Sunday, almost all of you raised your hand in agreement of the need for us to be intentional about seeking God's preferred vision for our future. As we're in this time of transition, to ask ourselves what's God's purpose and will for us in this congregation as we move forward. And, and you all raised your hand and said, yeah, that's really something valuable we ought to be doing. And I appreciate the conversation we had. The council asked that it would be a conversation, not just one way. And so I got the microphone ready, so we're, today we're going to continue that, and you can shape whatever you feel in, in response to what I ask here. Um, but, but as far as last week and the vision, I want you to know that in some time in the future, not too long, there's going to be a, a following the self-study process we're undertaking. Uh, there's going to be a time for all of us to come together, as many of us as possible, for a few hours on a Saturday morning, maybe through lunch, to participate in a process by which we can begin to see from the Lord and His Word and speaking through each one of us, because He hasn't given up on the gift of prophecy yet. He never will. Speaking through us, and maybe even just one of you, God's preferred vision for us as a congregation. And I want to tell you, having been through this with other congregations as a consultant, I can tell you that it's an exciting venture. It really is. It may seem chaotic, and, and, uh, but uh, that's how God works, in the chaos. You know? And I'm praying that 40 or 50 or 60 of us uh, could, uh, could be part of that when that happens. And so keep that in your mind, all right? Uh, and every single one of us is important to God. And every single one of us is important to, to uh, come together to seek God's vision for what we're going to be like as a congregation going forward. And that has a lot to do not with us sitting here, but with who's not sitting here. And I'm not talking about the other members. Okay? A second need that the consultation team identified was for all of us to be equipped for us to share our faith. And a few weeks ago, three of our SHLC people got up there and, and shared their stories. Remember that? It's pretty impressive and, and wonderful to hear uh, what God was 
was doing in their lives and, and how they shared their faith. And I think we're all pretty impressed by their stories. So raise your hand if you want to do the same thing. Uh, he's one. And he, he, he's not a plant, okay? <laughs> and that's about as I expected. In the morning service, there was about 100 folks here. They all slept in, right? Okay, you have no excuse here. I don't know what, what the... And there was about three people who raised their hand. That's what I expected, okay? So you can see the recommendation of the consultation was right on target. The need to share our faith. And I know that's kind of scary or intimidating or overwhelming. As I was putting these notes down on paper yesterday, I was thinking, boy, it's getting to be spring. And as I did, there's about 10 cars pulled up, and all the little league kids got out and started playing baseball in the parking lot, warming up. And so hopefully, the days are getting uh, closer, and the snow is going away, and we can see swarms of kids out there everywhere playing baseball and soccer and lacrosse and, I don't know, gymnastics and outdoor sport guys. No. But you do it anyway, right? Yeah? And, uh, but I'm a baseball guy. So I kind of think in those terms. Sorry, if you like other sports. So bear with me. Imagine being a team, a professional team. There's really only one the Yankees, right? <laughs> Sorry. In the last inning of the World Series, game seven, the winning run is at third base, needing to be knocked in, right? And the manager sends up a pinch hitter to get that run in. And he sends up a six-year-old who's just finished T-ball. Not much hope, is there? And I think that's how many of us feel when we hear someone talk about sharing our faith. Like, I can't do this. And this isn't meant here today to stir up feelings of guilt or inadequacy, okay? Not at all. Or maybe some anger. We always keep on hearing it's how we share our faith. But let's think a bit more deeply, not about sharing our faith, but about, about this challenge. See, before we can even talk about sharing our faith and the beliefs that we hold so dear, and maybe even experiences that we've had because of God's presence in our lives, we have to know why, right? Makes sense. Why does God want us to do this? Why share our faith? And the answer is pretty simple. But first, let's look to the Word of God this morning, uh, that we just read and, and that Sharon read and that I read in the second gospel reading, okay? And, and we have this part of the confession, but, but you know, this is what the early church did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and said, don't raise your hand, but how many of us devote ourselves to the apostles' teachings? See? And to fellowship. That doesn't mean just saying hello at the beginning of the service, but to actual caring. When you have a need, going over to your house, the other person's house, and being there for them. You know what I'm talking about, you know? Uh, and the breaking of bread, and that means communion. And, and to prayer. Well, maybe we devote ourselves to prayer, okay? Because that's all, this is a personal thing. We believe faith is personal, right? And it is, but it's also corporate. Okay? And so there's, there's a, a, a part of the church that's bigger than us. We're part of it, but it was meant to be all of us. Like we're in the boat together. Alright? And by the way, you know what they call this? They used to call this part of the church here, where we sit. Anybody? The nave. N-A-V-E. Like it's a ship, maybe. We're all in this boat together. <laughs> there was something about those Latin, you know, uh, things way back then, you know. And so, but this is what the early church did. They devoted themselves to prayer and to the Word of God and to communion and to they were together as we as we heard before in the, conf uh, in the confession. And they opened their their homes to each other. They opened their hearts to each other. And and God used that to multiply, multiply this church. On the day of Pentecost, just through the sharing of, of the testimony of 
those uh, 11 disciples. What does the scripture say in Acts? How many came to faith? 3,000. Okay, it's quite a multiplication. And then, and then in the uh, gospel reading, the second one that I read, you know, it was, it was Simon the fisherman, we know him as Simon Peter, but he wasn't known as Peter before this, this verse here. And, and Jesus was wondering, maybe he knew, he was wondering, okay, guys, who do people say that I am out there? Well, you're a prophet and all this other stuff, you're a wise teacher. And he said, how about you? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the promised one of God, the one who's going to be the Savior, and you are the son of the living God. Quite a statement. You know, and, and, and in another gospel, Jesus said, you didn't get that from yourself. The Father gave you that. And then he said to him, I'm going to build my church, Peter, not on you. I'm going to build my church on that confession of faith. And of course, then Peter and the others went out and confessed their faith. And so, so we're beginning to say, this is why and how God is going to build his church. God's telling us through his word today that the message that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior is the utmost reality and priority for his church. And the second is what happens when believers and followers of Jesus do what God has directed them to do. And what happens? The Lord adds to their number. So then, what would you say is the purpose of the church? And we'll get the microphone ready. Okay, we're going to put you on the spot. And uh, well, you're going to have to get up, okay? And, uh, because they're not going to raise their hands. I want the mic, okay? What would you say is the purpose of the church? Or as it says in the welcome there at the beginning, why on earth does the church exist? Why does the church exist on earth? Share with us. What do you think is the purpose of the church? Anybody? We're recording this. That's why we need a mic. So we're not going to say that, uh, that uh, Karen Gill said this. Go ahead, Karen. Ah, oh, come on! Purpose of the church. Help bring us closer to Jesus. Help bring people closer to Jesus. Go ahead. There you go. It also gives us a, a routine of, of making sure that we're constantly coming back to Jesus. Okay, and back yeah, to repentance. It gives us that foundation of of our life, you know? You know, like we have to eat to live, right? I live to eat, all right? But we have to eat to live, and, and so a part of our routine is spiritual food, spiritual life with God. If we don't have it, what happens? We stop it. To spread God's word? To spread God's word, the good word, right, of Jesus crucified, yeah. This morning we got also lots of things like the purpose of the church is to worship. Yeah? Well, that's an outcome of what, the, it's part of what the church does, okay? But that's not why Jesus ascended to heaven and told his disciples what? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all I've commanded you. That's the last words that Jesus gave to the church. Go and make disciples. How? Baptizing and teaching. And that's why it's important to see that those first Christians, right after Jesus ascended, they devoted themselves to that teaching. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, I want to cut you off, Peter says, and this is Peter who said, you are the Christ, he said, you were created to give praise to the God who brought you out of darkness into light. Okay, Adam, you're next. Uh, to commune as one body of Christ. To what? To commune as one body of Christ. Right, yeah. Commune as one body. And, you know, Jesus' hope was that the church would be one. You know, not, oh, I'm Catholic or I'm Protestant or I'm, you know, Presbyterian. One. Okay, but he also knew that we were human. So we're not always one, are we? See? You know? Anybody else? Remember the Sabbath, worship, right? Okay, but more than worship, it's to rest, take care of yourself, okay? Those are all parts of it. One more. To renew our relationship with Jesus. To renew our relationship with Jesus. Now, you can sit down. Good job. Tear to faith. But overall in that, God's purpose is to bring people into his saving kingdom. 
That's God's purpose for us, the church. Why? Well, frankly, because there's masses and masses and masses of people who are going to hell apart from God. And God doesn't want that. Remember in the, in the gospel, the gates of hell, he said, will not be able to withstand that's what it's all about. This is, you want to say a cosmic battle, but it's a spiritual, personal battle. Just like Jesus' words. So when Jesus, God doesn't want that for people, for anybody, that they would be apart from him forever. So when Jesus finished his saving work on earth and he returned to heaven, he created the, the church. That's what he did in his last words. He created the church to be his hands and his mouth and his heart for others. And he said, Peter, you're going to start this. Okay? And you're going to build the church, not as an organization of humans, but you're going to build the church based on that statement of faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's why we're here. That's the answer. Everything else falls under that. Good and right and proper and needed to do, but the purpose of the church is to show and share and tell the good news of others so that they can have life with God forever as well. That's why we're here. Not to tell others that they're going to hell. That's pretty arrogant, okay? And that's not what we're here to proclaim, despite what you may see on TV sometime or what's in the public or what the perception in the media is of the Christian church. But our purpose is to be useful to God in accomplishing his purpose, every single one. So back to baseball. Are you ready to go to bat? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. Most of us still feel like we're in T-ball, right? Or let's put it another way. To be honest, the devil is still tempting us to believe that we couldn't possibly do that. And, and the devil works that way. You couldn't. You couldn't possibly do anything more than kids can do. That's what the devil said. Or you couldn't do this. We have a film clip. You ready up there with that film clip? Okay. Well, caught her. She's so. It's going to take a minute for it to load. It's on YouTube. Okay. And if it doesn't, Faith's going to run up there faster than she ran around. <laughs> it's coming. And we'll see. There's a mouse. There it is. Maybe you saw this. And the Oscar goes to. Matthew McConaughey. Last Sunday. See it? We can. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to the Academy for this, all 6,000 members. Thank you to the other nominees. Uh, all these performances were impeccable, in my opinion. I didn't see a false note anywhere. I want to thank Jean-Marc Ballet, our director. I want to thank Jen Leto, Jennifer Garner, who I worked with daily. Um, there's a few things, about three things to my account that I need each day. Um, one of them is something to look up to, another is something to look forward to, and another is someone to chase. Now, first off, I want to thank God, because that's who I look up to. He's graced my life with opportunities that I know are not of my hand or the other human hand. 
um, he has shown me that uh, it's a scientific fact that gratitude reciprocates. Um, in the words of the late Charlie Lawton, who said, when you got God, you got a friend, and that friend is you. Um, that's to my family, family. Yeah. that's who and what I look forward to. To my father, who I know is up there right now. <laughs> it's amazing, huh? Now think about this guy, this actor. All the cheers he got, right? And the first thing he does, besides the nice things, the niceties, is he said, there's three things I, that are important to me. Someone to look up to, and what I look up to is God. And here he said that in front of the most hostile audience to the Christian faith that we know in the United States of America. That's Hollywood. I'm not bashing Hollywood, okay? Uh, you know, and when he said that, it was, okay, heartfelt from those who did. But you do that and your jobs are over. Hostile audience, anti-God, atheistic. Can you do that? Now, I think I could do that. But I'd never get an invitation to do it. <laughs> and it wouldn't carry the weight, the impact of Matt doing that. So I think God's going to leave that stuff and all the other big stuff up to others. Okay? He's saying, you guys can just play T-ball. <laughs> okay? Uh, and that's great. But what God is calling us to do is to be the light of the world. Remember, Jesus said that you're the light of the world. He said, you're the salt of the earth. Yes, we are. And when you were baptized, that was said to you. We gave you a candle. You maybe tried to eat it when you were a baby or blow it out, but you know, we gave you a candle and said, You are the light. Let your light so shine to others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. See? That's part of the baptismal rite. Okay? Light and salt. But often the church today, I'm not saying this congregation, so I'm not pointing fingers, but often the church today, not just here, the light is hidden. Under a bushel. Keeps us warm. We can read our bulletins. You know? And the salt, well, the salt doesn't lose its flavor. The purpose of salt is the flavor, to bring flavoring goodness to the world through the message of Jesus. Well, the salt hasn't lost its flavor, but it seems to remain in the salt shaker all the time. Doesn't it? Not at all serving the purpose for which it was created. So our purpose as a congregation is to have an effect on the world. To have an effect on other people. Don't think cosmically or globally. Another person. One person. Some of you know from your own experience the effect one person. A follower of Jesus and loved unconditionally has had in your life. So our congregation's second challenge is to grow to the place where we can share our faith. To grow to the place in ways that have an effect on the world, showing and sharing the love and hope of Jesus. So, do we, can we say, yes, we have that need? All of us have yeah, kind of pretty much do, don't we? To embrace God's purpose. Because we think, well, I'm just, everything's fine if I just make it to worship. And, well, that the salt's still the shaker. To embrace God's purpose for his church on earth and be willing to be part of it. And at the least, go through some spring training and practice games so that you're used to, to uh, uh, that being part of what we are about when the task may come before you. So, so you know, if you, if you recognize that need, and this, we have to do this, so raise your hands. If you recognize that need, and, and, and you know, we can say, yeah, we recognize that. I know it's hard to commit to anything today. We're so much more affected in our own lives by, by the realities of our lives in the world. And that causes us to withdraw, to step back. I don't want to make any more commitments, Pastor. See? And, uh, and, and I understand that, and neither do I. See? 
not necessarily like working 12 hours on a Sunday. We just take, you know, uh, but we, <laughs> we do that, right? Uh, willingly, joyfully, okay? And remember, when we talk about commitment, the commitment of that guy in the wilderness. He tempted. And to come through it. And to go to the cross. Jesus went to the cross. And what motivated Jesus? That's what God wants for every single person in the world. But it's not going to happen. I'm a realist. Okay? But we still have to do it. And there's urgency about this. It can't be put off or left to somebody else. Why? Well, here's a glimpse of reality today. Pastor Sparling sent it to me yesterday. It's two weeks in a row I've heard of him. He just heard about a book that was published ranking the most influential people in history and Jesus came in as number three. Who do you think came in as number one? Mohammed. Mohammed. And then uh, from this from the biography channel, Pastor Sparling said People were polled on who would you like to have dinner with, most important people, who would you like to have dinner with. Pastor Sparling said me. <laughs> but that wasn't in the book. Jesus came in number five. Who do you think was number one? Michael Jackson. And, and, and you, know, you know, put all that aside, but what is all that telling us? You see, what does that tell us? It tells us that fellow believers now are going to switch from baseball to tennis. <laughs> the ball is in our court. Okay. And, you know, I think we put our rackets down and catch the ball and say, well, that's great. I'm going to keep it. But the ball is in our court. It hits back. 